before. It's funny on in the fall how people's attitude on Sunday is dependent on what happened on Saturday. So I'm not really sure. I don't know that there was any like significant upsets or anything like that. So hopefully everybody's in a good mood today and excited about being here and what what God has in store. I know there are some of us who. Um, Charlie and Karen, they got their gear on over here. Just really, really um, disappointed what has happened over the last few days. Um, and so we're going to spend some, some dedicated time in prayer this morning for the Rangers. Um, yeah, it's bad. Anyway, I know we've got some guests who are here, so if I haven't met you yet, my name is Bill. And we do, uh, just kind of messing around for, for a second this morning, um, we love it when new folks come to our church, and so if there is ever anything that we can do, any questions that you have, please let us know. Visit us at the welcome desk at the back. I'll kind of hang out there after the service. Um, if I haven't met you yet, would love to introduce myself or answer any questions that you have um, today. So let me pray for us, uh, and then we'll get into the message. Father, you know, God, as we, we do come before you this morning, we are so thankful for your love and your grace uh, that you extend to us in spite of the fact that we don't deserve it. God, you chose to send your one and only son, Jesus, who laid down his life for us while we were lost in our sin, and you rescued us and have given us hope and a new life. And you've revealed in your word how we need to live to please and honor you. And so, Father, I pray that as we spend some time in your word today, that you would guide us in that, that we would truly be able to hear from you and know how to take what we talk about and apply it to our lives um, so that it, it would, would make a difference in how we live every single day. You got to recognize as we gather together today, we all do with different things weighing on our hearts and on our minds. And, and Father, I pray that we would just sense your work in our lives and, and see your hand at work around us. And may that comfort us. So, Father, just keep us from distractions over the next few minutes. Again, let us hear from you. May the words that I say um, be from you. Uh, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So today we are beginning a new series uh, called The Intersection. And so if you've been with us before, hopefully you've heard me say this on a number of different occasions. But it is our goal for everyone who's a part of the table to see your faith come alive. And what we mean by that is that we want to see faith be the thing that determines everything that we do. Because I think where we live, it's really easy for faith to just be this thing that we have, that we know allows us to get to heaven when we die, or maybe it's that thing that sits on a shelf that we can take down when we find ourselves in trouble, and then it helps us out in that. But faith is to be much more than that. It should be guiding everything that we do. Now, I also believe that every passage of Scripture is applicable for life. So the entire Bible, all 66 books, all applicable, should make a difference in our lives. Now, having said that, though, I recognize that there are some passages, some verses, where we have to do a little bit more work at understanding how they make a difference in our lives every single day. And then there are certain passages, certain sections that we look at, and we know exactly how that makes a difference in our lives because it deals with something that touches on an aspect of our daily living, makes a difference every single day. And so in this series, we're actually going to be looking at one of those sections as we look at the end of Ephesians chapter 5 and then Ephesians chapter 6. And so that's the kind of the overview of the series, the intersection where faith meets life. And so we're going to be talking about where faith meets life in the area of marriage today. And I know not everybody in the room is married, um, though that's going to be the primary focus of our time together. I hope that you do learn something and you hear something that even if you're not married, you can take and apply to your life and hopefully it makes a difference in the relationships of your life. Uh, so even if you're not married, I think that there is something here for you. Marriage is not a fairy tale. Now, as I say that, some of you hear that with a certain level of disappointment. Maybe some of you even disagree with that. My guess is if that's the case, maybe you're younger, uh, maybe not even married yet. Because those of us who are older, we understand the truth in that statement. But you know, for all of us, Fairy tales either set our expectations or our hopes for marriage. It's the story of Snow White 
And Prince Charming comes and rescues her and awakens her with true love's first kiss. Or it's the story of Cinderella, who had been mistreated much of her life, but there was somebody who saw through that and was willing to treat her as the princess that she really was. Or maybe it's even Shrek. You know, with the story of Shrek and Fiona, there were a lot more bumps in the road that led to them getting together. But, you know, the truth is all fairy tales end the same way. And they end this way. And they lived happily ever after. And so for some, that shapes our hopes in marriage. For others, that shapes our expectations. And you know what? Some people are able to experience happily ever after. For a few days. A few weeks be a few months or even a few years, but at some point, there's a bump in the road. There's a conflict that happens. And all of a sudden, when that takes place, we begin to think, well, wait a minute, something is wrong. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Maybe I made a mistake, and she's wrong, or he's wrong, or this is wrong, or I'm doing something wrong, or my spouse is doing something wrong. But I want you to know the truth about marriage. Marriage is hard, and I'll tell you why. It's because I am a selfish sinner. Now, I want you to say that to yourself. Some churches at this point would tell you to do it out loud. I think that's a little bit weird, so don't do it out loud, but say it to yourself in your head. The reason that marriage is hard is because I am a selfish sinner. Marriage is hard because I am a selfish sinner. It's not my spouse's problem. It's not that they're doing something wrong, but marriage is hard because I am a selfish sinner. Now, having said that, I don't believe that marriage is meant to be this just terrible experience that we have to live through. And I do believe as we understand more and more about what God's word has to say about marriage, and we take the principles that God has given to us and apply them to marriage, even though marriage is hard, we can experience more of those happily ever after days And that's my hope for all of us. So if you do have a Bible, I would invite you to turn to the passage that we're looking at this morning, Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 33. Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, it will be on the screen as I read it. Or uh, if you have the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, you can navigate your way to our live event and follow along there. But this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Ephesus And here are the instructions that he gives. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. To make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and and will be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. In our growth groups that we do on Wednesdays, I... I find myself talking about this a lot. I've said this in other venues from time to time. The challenge for us today in applying the scripture is in understanding the way that it was meant to be understood. Because every verse in the Bible was written to a real place with real people who had real problems, it's a challenge for us. There is not a verse in Scripture that is written to nameless, faceless people who existed at all times. It's all written to specific places with specific people who had specific problems. And because the Bible is an ancient book written to people who lived in an ancient culture, we need to understand a little bit about that culture so that we can then take a verse of Scripture or a section of Scripture and apply it well to our lives. And so as we begin our discussion on marriage this morning, it's really important to understand a little bit about the culture in Ephesus in the first century. 
in Ephesus in the first century, and this was really true uh, in cities throughout the Roman Empire, but the man, the husband, the father, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, held absolute authority over the family. Whatever he said went. Nobody had any thoughts outside of whatever the husband said, the man said, that's what went. And so that has to shape the way that we view this section of Scripture. There's a sense in which even the members of a family could be viewed as the man's property. Now, having said that, it's really important to frame what Paul is saying against that backdrop. And I love what one commentator said who really helps to frame what Paul is talking about in this passage as he's writing to the church in the city of Ephesus. He said this, that the instructions that Paul gave to the church are conservative socially within the culture. But it's important for us to understand at the same time that they are nonconformist and utterly uh, redemptive. So what that means is, yes, they're socially conservative within the culture, but yet at the same time, they didn't just, Paul wasn't just going along with what culture said. It was different than what culture said. But at the same time, it was very much liberating and redeeming for people within the culture. So there were significant changes that took place. So it's really important to understand that this was written to a specific culture that may have been dealing with cultural realities that are different than ours. At the same time, it's really important for us to understand when we look at a passage like this, that our culture and our experiences shape the way that we view what is found in there. And so as I read this passage of scripture just a couple of minutes ago, some of you might have thought to yourself, I'm not going to do that. I would never do that. Well, others, on the, maybe on the, the opposite end of the spectrum, look at it and idealize a certain family structure. And so you picture your favorite sitcom family, and you think to yourself, if we could just get back to that, then life would be wonderful. And so we have all of these preconceived notions about what this passage says as we read it or as we hear it. But I want to ask you to do something for me this morning. What I'm going to ask you to do is put aside your cultural experiences for just a few minutes and let's look and see what the passage actually says and then we we can begin to think about how to apply it to our lives and how it makes a difference. But as we begin to think about the way that faith intersects life in the area of marriage, the very first thing that we must do is talk about the goal of marriage. And I'll be honest with you, when I started in full-time ministry, I was in my mid-20s, and I was very much arrogant and naive. Recent seminary graduate, I had all of this knowledge, and I would look out at churches, and I would see all of the things that they were doing wrong, and I said to myself, I'm going to be better than that. All of those things that those other people are doing, I'm going to fix all of those problems. And I began to think about marriage. Because marriage, we've all heard the statistics, you know, 50% of marriages end in divorce and all of that. And so I knew that people were going to come to me and ask me to do their weddings. And I thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to be different than everybody else. My goal is to bat a thousand. So people are going to ask me to do their weddings. And what I'm going to do is develop some counseling sessions. I'm going to require premarital counseling for everybody, which I still do. And I think it's really helpful. But I just thought to myself, if I do this, I'll help people so that the Everybody that I ever marry will never, they'll never get a divorce. And I thought to myself, again, arrogant and naive. I recognize that now. But I thought to myself, it's really simple. I'll just take the Bible and tell people, here's what God's word says. And that's what I did. And so I would sit down with a couple and I would say to the the, the soon-to-be wife, I would say, look, here is God's instructions for you. Just do this. And I would say to the prospective husband, here's here's God's instructions to you. Just go do this. And if you guys just do these things, then you'll never have any problems. So that's what I did. I think lots of other books and curriculums do that. And what we do is we talk about the role, and never do we talk about the goal. And what we do is a lot like handing somebody a jigsaw puzzle and saying to them, listen, just put the pieces together. If you don't know how to 
put a jigsaw puzzle together. Look, I'll, I'll show you. You take this little piece, and it's got this thing that sticks out here. Somewhere in this pile of pieces is another piece that matches that, and there's an indentation on the other side, and they kind of click together, and that's it. Just go do it. So we hand them the pieces, but we don't give them a box. and don't show them what the picture is supposed to look like. Some people are really good at doing jigsaw puzzles. And so the first thing they do is separate out the, the border pieces, and so they're able to put the border together. And maybe they're able to get some other pieces together, but you know what? If you don't know what the picture is supposed to look like, it's really hard to judge your progress because you don't know where does this red part go versus the blue part or the green part or whatever it is. Other people don't have the patience to do jigsaw puzzles. And they're like, I don't have any idea what this is supposed to look like, so I'm not even going to try. And I think that's so often what we do. We talk so much about the role and we miss the goal. I believe the point of this passage in Ephesians chapter 5 is to focus on the goal, not so much the role. But that's where our focus is. We talk about the role all the time, and we miss the goal. And here's what you need to know. Marriage is God's gift to us for our sanctification or our spiritual growth. You've got to understand that from the jump. The the purpose of marriage, it's God's gift to us for our sanctification and our growth. It is not to find somebody who meets all of my needs and makes me happy. Now, hopefully, in our marriages, we find somebody who's a great compliment for us and can make us happy, but that's not the purpose. The purpose of marriage is God, it's God's gift to us to reveal our selfishness and our sinfulness so that we see that and we can deal with it. And then in the process of dealing with it, we can become more like Jesus. It's God's gift to us for our sanctification. Now, having said that, the point of this passage, the goal of marriage is found in verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's the goal, one flesh. So here it is. The result of a good, healthy marriage is partnership. The results of a good, healthy marriage is partnership. That is a quotation that Paul uses. It goes back to Genesis chapter 2. So we've got to go all the way back to the beginning when God created Adam and Eve. Adam was created first, placed in the garden. And God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Meaning that Adam alone could not do what humanity was created to do. And so God created Eve. God said, I will create a helper suitable for him. Or, I think we should understand it as partner. The reason I say that is because that word suitable helper, it is not a less than term. The reason we know that is because that term helper is most often used in reference to God who is our helper, and he is not subservient to us. And we're going to talk about definitions here in just a second, but understand this from the very beginning. Husbands, if the love that you have for your wife does not lead to partnership, then something is wrong. Wives, understand this. If your submission to your husband causes you to feel less than and does not lead to partnership, then there is something wrong. Because the goal of a good, healthy marriage is partnership. So let's talk about definitions. And this is where the rub is, because the first word that we have to define is the S word. Submission. What does it mean to submit? Submission is to voluntarily place yourself under someone so that their needs are above your own. Submission is to voluntarily place yourself underneath someone to put their needs before your own. Now, before you say, I don't like that, hang with me for just a second because this is all going somewhere. At the same time, I also want to point out, I read verse 21 to begin our scripture reading on purpose. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's a really important verse. There's a sense in which it concludes the section that came before, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Sing to one another psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making music in your melody to the Lord. At the end of that, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But at the same time, it also serves to be a topic sentence for the next several topics that come after it. 
which includes the section that we're looking at today. So as we think about submission, the very first thing we have to understand is that we all are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And wives are to submit to their husbands. But again, understand, this is a radical departure from the cultural norms of the day. Because in the first century, in Ephesus, a wife had to submit to her husband, and she had no choice in the matter. But here, Paul addresses wives and says to them, this is what you are supposed to do, but do this not because you have to or forced to, but because you desire to please the Lord in the process. So to submit, voluntarily place yourself underneath someone, putting their needs before your own. The second word that we have to define is the word respect. This one comes at the very end of the section, verse 33. To sum up, each of you, husbands, is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. So it's at the end of this entire section where Paul is addressing marriage, and he says, to sum it up, wives respect your husband which is really interesting because there was nowhere in that entire section that he talked about respect. He said submit, but then at the end, for whatever reason, Paul decides to change the word and he uses the word respect. Now, I'm going to mess us up for just a second, but again, hang with me because that word respect is the Greek word phobos, right? like phobia or fear. As you read that, you should think to yourself, that doesn't make any sense. A wife should not be afraid of her husband. It has to mean something else. And I would agree, it has to mean something else. But that word phobos can mean fear, like to be afraid of, or it could be the idea of to have the utmost respect for someone so as to seek only their good always. So that's the instructions to the wives. Submit to your husband voluntarily place yourself underneath someone, seeking, putting their needs before your own, and then respect, have profound respect for them to seek their good only always. And do this, not because you have to, not because culture forces you to, but do it because you are seeking to please the Lord. Then we get into the instructions to the husband. And four times in the section that gives instructions to the husbands, husbands are commanded to love their wives. And the question is, what does it mean to love? To love is a willful decision to put the needs of someone else before your own. Now, did you get the connection? To submit is to voluntarily place yourself beneath someone, putting their needs before your own, To love is to put someone else's needs before your own. It's a willful decision to do that. And again, this is absolutely goes against everything that was taking place in the culture of the first century. A husband would never think, I need to love my wife. At best, they would think, I need to care for my wife or I need to provide for her. Never would they think, I need to love my wife and certainly not do it in the way that Paul described because he describes it in two ways. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and husbands, love your wives as you love yourself. The first one, that's the model for us, the love that Christ has for the church. That's the love that we should have for our wives. Whatever, however Jesus loves us, that's the love that we have for our spouse. The second part, love your wife as you love yourself. It really just grows out of that one flesh principle. Here's kind of what Paul's saying. You need to love your wife as yourself because you know what? Because of the one flesh principle, she is yourself. And so that's the instructions. Wives submit and respect. Husbands love. And don't miss it. Again, you've got to see this. Submit voluntarily place myself under someone to put their needs before myself. To love is a willful decision to place someone else's needs before my own. It goes back to verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That goes back to the instructions that we read in Philippians chapter 2, which is for all believers in all relationships that says, don't just consider your own needs, but consider the needs of others first. Something else I think is really, really important about this passage of Scripture is that I believe that this is not about power dynamics at all. And I'm going to show you why. 
I'm going to make some observations, and these observations are really, really important because of how this passage and passages like it often get misunderstood. So again, let's just look and see what is there. First observation is this. Wives are to submit to their husbands, not all men. That's really important. Wives are to submit to their husband, not all men. The reason that that is such an important observation to make, because that's what the text says, the reason it's an important observation to make is because there are some circles that teach women are submissive, all women are submissive to all men, thinking power dynamics. In fact, I heard a story recently from uh, somebody that, I, that went to the same school that I did. She graduated a few years after me, but they were in class one day talking about this concept of submission. And she raised her hand. She said, I just want to make sure that I understand what you're saying correctly. So if this guy that's sitting next to me, that I barely know his name, if he were to lean over to me right now and say, hey, go get me a Coke, based on what you're saying, I would have to get up and do what he asked me to do. And the professor thought for a second and said, well, yeah, I think you would. And her response was, that's crazy town, which I agree. That's crazy town. Because that is not in this passage. It is not teaching submission of women for all, to all men. And some would argue that's what, well, that's what 1 Timothy teaches. And I think that's a misunderstanding and misrepresentation of what we read in 1 Timothy as well. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. Now, there is something that we need to talk about in this, though. Because it says in verse 24, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. And when we think in terms of power dynamics, that's where women say, so I just have to do whatever he tells me to do? I'm not going to do that. And I would say, you don't have to do that. If it's not about power dynamics and then therefore doing whatever my husband says, if it's not about that, then it's about not compartmentalizing. So here's what I think Paul is saying. You place the needs of your husband before your own, not just on certain days or with certain things, but you do it all the time with everything. That's the first observation. Second observation is this. It's really important to see this. Husbands aren't told to make sure that their wives submit to them. And wives are not told to make sure that their husbands love them. Now, it's probably the first that we hear more often. I've heard it. Sometimes this is a joke. I've heard it as a legitimate instruction given to a husband. Hey, you need to get your wife under control. It's not in the passage. That's not our job. Our job as husbands is not to make sure that our wives submit to us. Wives, at the same time, it is not your job to make sure that your husband loves you. It is the wife's responsibility before the Lord to submit to her husband. It's the husband's responsibility before the Lord to love their wife. Another observation, i got to show you this. This this one I think is going to blow you away, but i got to set it up first. So typically what we do is we have marriage studies. And within a marriage study... The the ladies get together, they talk about the role of a wife, and they talk about what it means to submit. Talk about the implications of that, definition of that, all of those things. I'm not an expert in that, never once been to a women's Bible study before. On the other side, we get together as men, and we talk about the responsibilities of men. And I have been to these men's Bible studies before, so I feel like I can comment on it a little bit more. And we talk about the roles of husband that includes two things, to lead and to love. And if our time together is an hour-long study that day, we spend the first 45 minutes talking about what it means to lead, the definition of leadership, and the implications of leadership. For about the next five minutes, we talk about what it means to love. In the last 10 minutes, we just talk about what's going on in life, pray for one another, and then we leave. Okay, you ready? It's going to blow you away. Husbands are not commanded to lead their wives in this passage. Isn't that crazy? Now, you could say it's stated as fact, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but it's stated as fact in the instructions to wives. Wives, submit to your husbands because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. 
It is fascinating to me that Paul does not say anywhere, husbands, lead your wife. We got to ask why. As much time as we spend talking about leadership in our families, and I think it's a helpful conversation at times, don't get me wrong, I think that that's helpful. It's fascinating to me that Paul does not circle back and say, guys, this is really important. He doesn't do it. And so we got to ask why. Now, maybe the reason that Paul doesn't say that is because it was so understood within the culture that Paul didn't need to address it. If that were the case, here would be my question. Well, Paul, why didn't you define leadership better? Because you know that there are abuses of leadership that were happening in families. That had to be the case. And in light of the fact that Jesus redefined leadership and Peter redefined leadership in their writings, why wouldn't Paul say, if we're, if we're supposed to talk about this all the time, why doesn't Paul say, hey, it's really important to understand what leadership is all about. And here's what it looks like. But he doesn't do that. And so maybe, this is just me, speculating, I don't know this for sure. I'm wondering, maybe the reason that Paul doesn't address leadership within the family is because when we spend time talking about leadership, even good leadership, healthy leadership, it leads into discussions about power dynamics and who's really in charge and may even lean into authoritarian leadership when in reality the only conversation that we need to have as husbands, is what it means to love. Because over and over, that's what Paul says. Husbands, love your wife. What time is it? i got to figure out how to land this plane. I need to talk about this before we get into that. I'm, we're just going to... We'll, Wherever Miranda is, we're probably going to go over. I told her beforehand. In this section where Paul writes, in, this, in the, the instructions to the wives, he says, a wife is to submit to her husband because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. That's that leadership discussion. And so there are all, there's debates about the, the idea of headship, what it means. And so heads, there's arguments back and forth. Does headship mean authority or does it mean source? Authority like, hey, when it comes down to it, the husband is the one who's in charge or source meaning like the one who is to provide nutrients for things like that. So all these debates that go back and forth. What does this really mean? How do we live it out? These debates go back and forth. And I say, well, wait a minute. I don't know why we're having this argument so much because doesn't Paul at least give us an idea of what it means. Because he says, verse 23, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. At least in application, if not definition, as Paul writes, the husband is the head of the wife, he defines it or applies it as self-sacrifice. That's why I don't think that this passage has to do with power structure at all. It's not about power or authority. It's about sacrifice. Okay. Now, having said all of that, I recognize, man, part of, I want to be super honest. I don't know if you guys have heard the term imposter syndrome before. What that means is like you feel like you're not the one who's worthy of talking about that subject. And there's a huge part of me that says probably somebody else should talk about this. Because I don't necessarily think that I li live these things out well all the time. Because it's hard. At the same time, I also recognize today, in light of what we've talked about so far I probably have surfaced more questions than I've given answers for. And so I want you to know, if you do have questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I will respond to your questions, but understand it's entirely possible that the answer to your question is, man, that's a great question. I'm not really sure. That's really hard. Having said that, though, I do want to give us three 
principles of application. They're not like super practical, but these are things that we, I think we have to think through in light of what I believe that this passage teaches us. First principle of application is this. Marriage can never be 50-50. We have to think, I will do everything and expect nothing. That goes against everything that we think within our culture. Because we think division of labor, that's what partnership is. It's 50-50, you do this, I do that, and life's going to be great. We cannot think that way. We have to think, and I recognize the challenge in this, I will do everything and expect nothing. But the reason that I say that is because that goes back to verse 21, submit to one another, putting the needs of other people first. That goes back to Philippians chapter 2, don't just think about your own needs, but think about the needs of others. And we get down into verse 5, it says this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And I'll summarize the next few verses. Jesus gave up everything, became nothing, taking upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient to death on the cross where he accomplished everything for our salvation. That has to frame the way that we think about marriage. Number two, point of application, thing to think through. The love that you have for your spouse is modeled after Christ's love for you. I recognize it says, husbands love your wife. We've talked about it. If not definition, if they're not synonyms as, they, as, as submit and to love as they play themselves in our, out in our lives, they look really, really similar. And so I believe for all of us, the love that we have for our spouse, both husbands and wives, the love that we have for our spouse must be modeled on Christ's love for us. That's the measuring stick. That's the guide. And you have to know the love that Jesus has for us is both unconditional and never ending. And I know as I say that, some of you might be thinking, well, what about? Gosh, and there's a lot of what abouts. Yes, the Bible talks about divorce, and there are reasons legitimate reasons for divorce. And the last thing that I would ever do is tell somebody to be in an abusive marriage or something like that. But at the same time, as we think about our relationships with our spouses, we have to think through the grid of my love for my spouse is to be modeled after Jesus' love for me, which is unconditional and never ending. And that has to shape the way that we live. Has to. Last point of application is this. you got to understand that the goal of Christ is to reconcile all things to himself. And with that being said, marriage is meant to be a testimony of this reality to the world. I haven't really touched on this much. And I, obviously, I, I mean, I don't have time to do it now. But this is really interesting. Verse 32. This mystery is profound. But I'm talking about Christ in the church. If we had more time, I would develop it more. This is really interesting. When you, if we were to take time and stop and go through every single word, every single verse, because there are certain things, especially in the section that talks about uh, the love that husbands should have for their wives, there are certain things in there in that discussion that are not parallel, that are only just the work of Jesus for us, washing us with water through the word, all that kind of stuff. There is no parallel in terms of the husband's responsibility to his wife. I don't believe that. So what we would find at the end of the day, if we were, and I could develop this more for you. At the end of the day, we would look at this passage, and because he says this is a profound mystery, I'm talking about Christ in the church, we would say, well, wait a minute, Paul. Are you talking about the relationship between a husband and wife and using the illustration of Christ in the church to help us to understand that relationship? Or are you really talking about the relationship between Christ and the church and using the relationship between a husband and wife to help us to understand the relationship between Christ and the church? And here's what I would say. Yes. There is a sense in which our relationship as husbands and wives has to be patterned after the relationship between Christ and the church. At the same time, as we're able to live out that reconciling work of Jesus in our marriages, our Christian marriages should show the world what, the, what Jesus desires to do in our lives. And that is an incredible privilege and honor, but also a huge responsibility to live that out so that people see in us and in our relationships what Jesus wants to do in 
all of our lives. Marriage is not a fairy tale. But if we're able to consistently say in our relationship, hey, it's not about me and I'm willing to put the needs of my spouse before my own, and I do it all the time because that's what it means to submit, that's what it means to love, it's then that we'll be able to experience some more of those happily ever after days. And it is my prayer for us that God gives us wisdom to know how to do that on a practical level every single day so that people could look at us and say, and that's what God wants to do in all of our lives. Will you pray with me?